Welcome to our HashiConf talk this year. We'll take you up to the sky and lift off to the cloud. Um, I brought my colleague Wax today. He will take over later for some nice demo. Uh, he's located in Budapest usually and is in our team as a systems engineer. Um, and our department is called the Technology Center of Excellence. Um, to myself, I'm Stefan. Um, around three years with Lufthansa, based out in Berlin, and I'm an enterprise architect in the same department. Uh, that you know where we come from, um, Lufthansa should be familiar, familiar with you. We're both from Lufthansa Systems, 100% subsidiary of the Lufthansa Group, which includes also the Lufthansa Airlines. Uh, we've been founded back in 1995, so been here since quite some time. Our headquarter uh, is in Raunheim, which is a small city uh, right next to the airport in Frankfurt. And uh, we have offices around the world. Uh, our larger ones are in Germany, Hamburg, uh, like Berlin, as well as Budapest in Hungary and uh, Gdansk in Poland. We also have a facility in Zurich and around two and a half thousand employees uh, worldwide. Uh, we do provide several products and services uh, around, um, let's say, 350 and even a little bit more customers we do have on the external market um, with all kinds of like sizes, basically. And this is like airlines all over the world. So probably when you have been on an aircraft, you have been in contact with one of our products already, even if you don't know. So I brought some figures, basically, that you can visualize what we are doing as a company. Um, so with our products, it ranges from uh, everything that has to do um, on ground operations. So before actually an aircraft takes off until um, an aircraft takes off and then also afterwards for um, payment and refunding and everything in that area. So you can imagine that um, around 45% of all flights being operated in Europe um, is using one of our biggest products called Lido Flight. And uh, we do have in the operational area various products for crew planning. So like what, what colleagues are uh, working together on an aircraft, the pilots and so on. And um, also um, various products around the scheduling and planning of the um, yeah, aircraft schedule. Um, so in the other area that we have also um, various products is in the area of the commercial side. So imagine you're booking a flight online and it gives you some price and basically the price is being calculated based on some demand figures and this is what we supply. One of the products where you probably came in touch with is when you have been in um, an, an aircraft and you were watching some videos, basically the entertainment system. Um, in front of you that is also a part of our product portfolio. But that's enough already uh, about some um, topics what we do at Lufthansa Systems. Uh, let's move on uh, to the topic and um, so before we uh, jump right into what we will presenting to you I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview uh, where we started uh, with our cloud journey and where we are in at the moment. So I would assume as lots of enterprises. Uh, we had classic data center operations um, until some years ago and we still have them um, but we were kind of forced to move into cloud. Um, that was due to uh, those data centers um, shall be closed and therefore we have to migrate all of our applications and customers to another landing zone and um, besides of this a problem uh, we also um, do have a very classic IT organization, uh, mostly ITIL and ticket-based working. Um, probably also nothing special uh, in, in, in today's worlds. Um, we did start with some of automation, basically using uh, Terraform open source and some Ansible for configuration management and um, yeah, started to uh, do our thing basically but uh, kind of it was a start from zero so and then basically um, we realized some time ago that we do not even have close to enough automation so this is like binding our valuable cloud engineers and resources 
to just repetitive tasks. So we are not able to like uh, deliver new fancy features because we have to work on migrating applications, uh, spinning up virtual machines and, and services like manually because there was not enough automation. So uh, besides of that, um, we have also built uh, before an ecosystem with like very static secret management. So like secrets never expired and uh, they are like static and this is just not good uh, for, for modern world operations. Um, obviously our, um, let's say, environments, they grew. We had more customers or we have more customers joining, migrating to the cloud. Uh, we weren't able to properly like scale up our teams, so that is clearly resulting then in an overwhelming of our uh, teams basically, and we like literally uh, had like bursting ticket queues and uh, like folks who were just busy with with doing uh, ticket work. Um, on the other hand, everything just gets more complex, meaning we get new providers, we do new prototypes. We should introduce new technology, so we are kind of developing ourselves to uh, a continuous learning organization. And, and this just brings uh, complexity. It, it doesn't uh, get the organization more simple. So you have more providers, you have to uh, onboard them, you have to manage them. And uh, this is just getting complex without any automation. And then, on the other hand, we have our different product teams being responsible, obviously, for their product development they just grew on their uh, maturity level of knowledge in cloud native technologies, in platform services, in what the different cloud providers can offer you, which is uh, a really good thing. And, um, but we didn't expect that to happen so fast. And uh, that is why there is a need that has developed, which is basically that we have to provide our central uh, services inside Lufthansa systems uh, with an API so that simply the product teams do not have to wait for some engineer to do the work that they need to be executed. Um, they just want an API that they can do the things on their own. On the other hand, we are um, still ramping up teams. We are still uh, spreading knowledge about GitOps expertise and uh, you know, Terraform and, and the usual uh, tooling. And um, that is basically when we realized we have to like introduce this um, API framework. And what we have done is we have created a thing that we call the vending machine. Um, and funnily, we also found a proper picture in some fan, uh, nice Chinese supermarket. And uh, this is like reflecting uh, the story behind uh, what we are doing. So the vending machine is basically, uh, you could say a 24 hour open store. You can just go in there a convenient way. Uh, you can go shopping anything you need, like a self-service, and you put like a coin in, in, in our case, it's like a cost center, um, and you basically just get the goods out. Um, this whole thing is fully modularized, so you can uh, just easy extend it with any additional goods. Uh, I mean, it's like in a physical vending machine, you can just put another um, item in there and you can buy it. Um, and basically the idea is that we are providing this from developers for developers. So um, one thing we don't have yet is the light music as shown on the picture, but we're working on that one for sure. Um, how the structure of it is, is that each good in the vending machine is representing a central service offering. Um, that could be for example, an Azure subscription in Azure Cloud, that could be a project on, on Google Cloud or just an AWS account. Um, the vending machine itself can be kind of understood as a framework um, and it kind of offers the runtime environment for it. It itself does not implement a good. So it's just like defining the API structures to the consumers of the vending machine. Um, the core concept ba uh, is based on, on simply Terraform and uh, internally we have a code name that we call GitOps 2.0 for it. Um, and um, the services that we are building also in uh, some of our delivery teams in our department, the technology COE, 
um, they are kind of plugged into the framework. So the teams responsible to maintain the services uh, could be like um, Kubernetes, orchestration, observability uh, platform. So we have a lot of those services and uh, the, the aim is that they will be uh, plugged in into the, the vending machine. Um, every of those internal services should be ultimately then also provisional uh, by it. So we're not there yet, but we have like a good set of services already integrated um, that we're also going to show you uh, later on. Um, before we step into uh, the demo that you're probably all looking for, uh, I wanted to uh, give you a glimpse of an overview, how the structure of it is, that you will understand um, how it is working. So we basically realize that when you're trying to onboard a new component, there is like nothing. You all know it. You get like a root account on AWS. You get an empty Azure enrollment enterprise access to the enterprise portal. And you usually start like creating stuff manually. And this is like what we just didn't do. So we from the beginning on, like nothing is there. Um, we started to uh, create things in an automatic fashion. And this step is the step zero, how we call it. And we call this basically the seeding. Um, so the code name is like base seeding. So it's a seed coming out of the, the base, so to say. Um, on this picture, you will see a couple of the components that we are seeding. So that could be uh, the Terraform Enterprise provider, um, that is the HashiCorp platform provider to, for example, create service principles or um, yeah, basically create the um, automation accounts that we can then use uh, later on for the proper integration in the vending machine. Um, we also do see the different cloud environments that we are having. So that could be uh, on the GCP that is just uh, basically the um, service account uh, with an initial um, set of root privileges um, that we're then continuing to use um, to yeah, configure a Google Cloud. Um, the same thing on Azure, the same thing on GitHub and any of the other components. So the goal of the seeding simply is to kind of Mm, with impersonification of an administrator execute a Terraform run, like a one-time thing more or less, that with an outcome has a persistent secret that we can then use to configure dynamic secrets, um, secret engines and continue to configure the actual service. Um, the step one is now the more interesting one. Uh, it's basically something we call um, the base landing zone. So it's kind of the self-service now where um, the consumers can define their services. And it basically looks the way um, at the moment that there is like a kind of a central repository um, in Git and uh, there the consumer can just raise pull requests and like put in the code of the services that he uh, wants to be provisioned. And then basically uh, we continue with various uh, checks uh, running on actions, uh, like a validation, some linting, um, some notifications, um, and a set of policies with Sentinel uh, that has to be extended um, in one of the future steps. Um, and then when we did like a short peer review and everything looks fine, uh, we get this shipped and it's kind of merged um, out and then obviously um, and apply will start running. Um, the execution itself uh, is happening on Terraform Cloud, um, which just doesn't give us the hassle of having to maintain um, our previous setup, like with Jenkins, with um, you know different code, uh, code version uh, systems, and, and so on. So we basically this time decided to um, use platform services wherever possible. So if there is something. We're just going to use it and don't give us the hassle with operating it ourselves. So that, that is why uh, we basically go with, with Actions and, and also with Terraform Cloud. Um, yeah. But back to the, the vending machine. So on, on Terraform Cloud, we um, basically uh, this, this landing zone provisioner is invoking various set of modules that we have created. And we have like an, an umbrella module that we call the TCOE landing zone module. Um, this basically um, has a subset of um, multiple modules, which are reflecting now kind of the services. 
So um, if a consumer, for example, wants to provision an Azure landing zone, um, this is invoking the Azure landing zone module. And the Azure landing zone module in that case is based on the CAF um, framework that is provided by Microsoft. Um, kind of a new thing which we can uh, recommend very well. Um, and this uh, basically uh, will take care on um, creating new subscriptions, um, making sure that subscription is part of a proper management group structure. It's uh, kind of configuring the RBAC permission, so uh, who gets what permission. Um, it can attach a different set of Azure policies um, and basically so on and so on. So this is like extendable um, to whatever you basically need as long as the provider is supporting it. Um, we do the same thing with uh, the rest of the modules as well. So you'll see modules for GitHub, which is our um, version control system in this demo, and uh, the same thing with uh, Vault and, and, for example, Google Cloud. So and when, when this provisioning kind of has finished and it was successful, consumer gets notified and he basically has then his landing zone provisioned, ready to use. And uh, this you see on the right side, basically the Hashi LSY and one. Um, and this brings me to the second step. So, and the second step is what we call the consumer's landing zone customization. So the customization now is fully up to the consumer. So meaning he can literally do what he wants as long as it's compliant to the policies that are applied. So um, effectively a new GitHub repository has been created and it has been pre-configured with all of the providers and input variables um, in the workspace that is required. So in that example um, the, the consumer uh, requested a new Azure subscription, a new Azure landing zone and this results in a, a dynamic secret engine being created in Vault for Azure and this is like being hooked into his workspace and also templated into his repository. So the consumer will always find a um, Terraform file called tcoe.tf and this is like containing all of the configuration that we give the consumer. So like uh, he's not supposed to like touch it um, but he's still like fully responsible. So if he changes something and it doesn't work, then usually he has also to fix it. Um, and the rest is really being left to the consumer. So we'll push him some pipelines that kind of take care on provisioning and execution, but um, the rest is kind of up to him really. Um, how it then works is the same thing. So he has a consumer pipeline um, that also runs on actions. Um, it does the same things like some validation, um, some documentation um, and so on. When some pull request is fine, again, it gets merged. And then uh, what we have built is what I just explained. So the Vault provider actually is hooked up. Um, we do use here also Vault and HCP. We've been one of the launching customers um, for the product and we are really, really happy with it. It's been um, very stable. So there wasn't a, like a single outage or anything. And um, yeah, I can, I can only recommend it um, so far. Um, so we invoked that one. Um, there a secret engine gets hooked. Uh, it's like connected directly to the subscription that was created for the consumer. So it has the respective permission um, to execute, um, update any resources basically on Azure. Um, and that is like what is passed on to the Azure provider. So there will be a very temporary um, yeah, service principle available uh, during the execution run of the pipeline. And when the pipeline is like finished, um, it gets cycled after the TTL expired. Um, also for some governance, um, we do have the cost estimation thing enabled. So we basically, the consumer will always see if um, like he accidentally provisioned more resources than he was intended to. And um, also uh, the goal is to bring in here an extensive set of Sentinel policies, which I must admit we are like in the beginning on, on that um, journey. Now, Quickly looking at the runtime, you've already seen some of the components that we're using. So, but I think it's important to um, like bring it onto one slide that you know where stuff is like running and what we're using. So basically the thing is like, 
we do have something that we call the front end. <laughs> Um, and as it is with some, um, uh, let's say, um, back-end developers, the front-end until now is not so well developed. We basically just have the uh, version control thing right now, um, but we do have on the, on the roadmap to add our, um, let's say, uh, systems which gives an interaction with also uh, non-technical users. So that could be um, from Atlassian, the Jira um, um, REST hooks, and that could be as well a service now for the um, yeah, provisioning, so to say. And the idea is that they get hooked into the Git flow, basically, so we still have the Git as the single source of truth for everything. Um, so besides that, um, we do have, I mentioned it, uh, the GitHub Action ecosystem. We do have some uh, thing that um, if there should be resources configured that are non-Terraform, uh, resources. We do still use Ansible because we there have an um, excessive set of roles meanwhile written also for our different products so we'll just continue using it. So basically um, after a resource has been created like a virtual machine on, on Terraform or something uh, we do invoke um, the hosts and so on into uh, the Ansible ecosystem and then continue to configure it um, if required. So if this is resources that don't need like configuration management, uh, this doesn't have to be used. So basically after GitHub Actions, we do have options of um, like writing Ansible roles, uh, writing Terraform modules. They will be stored in the private registry on Terraform Cloud. And as well, we do have our workspaces with the states on Terraform Cloud. Uh, as I mentioned, we do use the uh, Vault on HCP, and this is basically hooked into the system to take care on the dynamic secret creation for any of those components, as long as there is a secret provider available. And then, basically, um, we get out the apply, and this will just talk to the different APIs that we're using, uh, if that's Google Cloud or Azure or anything else, uh, this basically is how it works. Um, Besides the um, hosted um, runners or agents on, on Terraform Cloud, we do have a set of self-hosted ones and we kind of can't get rid of them because we do need the private connectivity into our network, for example, to let um, Ansible connect to the, to the hosts because they're not reachable from the internet. So I brought this little scheme here, um, basically representing the short structure of the landing zone that a consumer can choose. As you can see, um, each of this has always a version. It has some metadata. We do map it to a single Git repository. We have the plan to support also multiple version controls. At the moment, it's just working with GitHub. Um, as well, we do have a single Terraform workspace on the Terraform cloud and some hidden space in Vault where we do configure the secret engines. In the bottom, it's just the configuration block where um, the consumers can put in the goods that they want to be vended. And currently we do support Azure, Google, Vault, and basically some network configuration so that the consumers, when they have their subscription, they get connectivity into our backbone. So we do provision them kind of spokes into the deployment. As well, they can provision Git repositories and uh, various other things, but it's not worth to mention. So basically, I'm handing over to my colleague uh, Vax, who will be showing some demo now. So this demo will be about provisioning a consumer landing zone from our base landing zone, as now it is the front end, and we'll have some example resources in our consumer uh, landing zone. So let's dig in. As you can see here, we have the landing zone definition, which is incorporating our own DCOE services uh, coming from the umbrella module, uh, where we are putting the metadata and a lot of stuff configured through this. We are sending the information through maps, uh, like here we are uh, setting the Terraform Enterprise workspace variables and all the runtime configuration for it. And also, we'd like to do a bold consumer namespace, uh, as you can see it here, where the consumer itself can use its own very bold namespace. And uh, there we can see that we have Azure here. Uh, we would uh, use some Azure resources as well in the demo. 
So uh, let's go to the umbrella module structure. We have nested modules here, which are actually describing all the services that we want to provide. And for now, Stefan will be our uh, consumer and he will create a pull request for us for his new consumer landing zone. We just got the request. Stefan made a uh, as a new request for us to create a consumer landing zone and he, as we can see, uh, wants it very urgently. So for that, our process is now started and we go to review uh, his code. As we've seen, he requested our review as the TCOE Foundation. So let's just check what Stefan wants to do. as consumer, he needs a new landing zone with this configuration. So let's just review these changes and approve it. Yep, here you go. Looks good to me. And now all the pre-checks have started also with the documentation generation. And here we have the steps when the pull request is opened. So for now, we have those basic stuff like linting and other, but the most important part in this uh, pull request workflow is the plan phase, uh, which could take some time actually, uh, but we have plans uh, for further optimization uh, on the runtime. You can see the plan is running nicely uh, and after a brief moment we have the actual plan and then I need to review again because documentation generation just made some modification and yeah looks good to me as well so now we can see that everything is green and we can hit merge which will fire our actual build workflow which will do the real uh, stuff behind all this. So let's go back to the base landing zone and we'll see that we've merged. So our commit is on master. Uh, so now we started the build, the actual build, which would take more time. All stuff is running uh, in Terraform Cloud, so therefore we don't need to hassle with the Terraform and uh, Terraform environment setup, as you can see it here. And now this would take some time, so we just jump a little, and we can see that our resources are being created, and then we are good to go with that quite short Terraform apply. So let's check our new fresh and crispy consumer landing zone, greetings, HashiConf. Um, as you can see, we have already a pull request opened, which is for the TCOE services to be merged as our all of our backend configuration is coming from there for our services. So the consumer itself don't need to hassle with the workflows or with the backend configuration to our services like do, 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 do. yeah, this will go. So in the TCO.tf, we have the pre-configured backend endpoints, for example, the Terraform workspace or the Vault namespace for generating dynamic service principles for Azure and the Azure RAM provider itself as the Vault consumer namespace backend. So after everything's fine, we just create the pull request Now you can see that the test pipeline has finished 
and the plan output is what we've defined in the consumer landing zone with our example resources for Azure RAM and for Vault as well. So now let's go back and to the bad practice. I use my administrator privileges to merge this, uh, but this would be on the consumer side. So the merge is finished. Then uh, we fire up our build pipeline as you see before in the base landing zone. And after everything's finished, we see that the apply is checked. So let's just... So the build has finished. Let's check what resources we've created. As we've seen that the Terraform apply is okay. Bring up the old terminal and let's just go and get the secret from Vault. So we can see that we have all the resources that we've generated in all the corresponding platforms. Thank you, Stefan. So hey, thanks Wax for that pretty awesome demo. Um, I'll keep it short now in the end with you and I basically just wanted to bring also some stuff about the limitations that we had to deal with during our implementation. Uh, we're going to need some support from you for some of the issues so you can like thumbs them up. One of the bigger things that we were dealing with were simply that providers were lacking features. So we usually had to find some workarounds with uh, non-Terraform resources doing it in Azure CLI or Bash whatever fits in. Um, one of the still persistent issues is the authentication of dynamic providers. So because we are like configuring stuff that we are handing over to the consumer, we want to like continue configuring it before we hand it over. And currently this forces us to do another Terraform run in a different uh, workspace, which could be avoided if this would have been implemented in Terraform. Also, as you can imagine, this uh, is getting quite a beast. So we do have kind of complex graphs and this is sometimes taking some, lo some uh, long plans but we're optimizing on it. Um, obviously you probably also came around it. Um, there are some API issues now and then with specifically Azure. Uh, we run into this. Um, we also run into funny uh, things that we couldn't like explain until today and then they were like magically solved by the Microsoft support. Um, also, uh, the thing is that uh, GitHub Actions, we do use to compensate some of the features that uh, the Terraform uh, cloud doesn't have yet. We know that there's this beta function of the tasks, but we just don't use it yet. So we still have a lot of things to do, but um, I think we do have already some good bases on which we can continue to develop on. Um, we are planning on doing some more integration of Sentinel policies and definitely improving the front ends. And we just have to get a, like a general available version, like the version one shipped. And uh, yeah, so we'll just keep it as it comes and continue our flow here. This brings me right to the end of the presentation. Um, Wax and myself, we are very happy to have joined here and wish you all a very nice uh, HashiConf now after our talk. Thank you very much for listening and uh, have a good day. Bye-bye.